August Assembly, ladies and gentlemen, I am delighted to join you today at the opening session of this year's Pan-African Parliament. And before I proceed, I must take this opportunity to express my gratitude to the President of the Republic of South Africa for the generous reception that my delegation and I received on arrival at this beautiful country and the warm hospitality that we have enjoyed throughout our stay, our bonds of African fraternity and solidarity continue to grow stronger and deeper. The Pan-African Parliament is a critical organ of the Africa Union whose full institutional potential is going to become manifest as we rally to formulate effective and sustainable solutions to the tremendous cries confronting our people and humanity in general. This parliament rises higher and goes further than the sum of its legislative representative and oversight mandate for Africa. It provides a fundamental deliberative forum where the peoples of Africa gather to reason exhaustively together and develop African solutions to Africa's problems. This assembly is the august crucible where the full range of African voices, the diversity of African ideas, and the variety of African insights interact and generate the principles and knowledge that we need to inform our endeavors to give present and future generations a prosperous and a secure Africa together with a livable planet. I therefore congratulate all of you for the confidence you have clearly inspired to be chosen as the African people's representatives in this parliament. You take your seats in this house at a very critical time for Africa and the world. The world is presently confronted with a daunting array of multifaceted challenges, which range from the pandemic recovery to the existential threat of climate change. There is also the prevailing adverse financial environment characterized by increasing interest rates and looming debt distress affecting Africa and the many other regions, not forgetting the complex security implications of a delicate geopolitical crisis. At this time, your leadership as members of this House is more vital than ever to guide and support all other institutions of the African Union in pursuit of a new, ambitious, and inspiring vision. It is a time to be bold, to be strong and resolute enough to confront these challenges with greater unity and greater commitment. It is time to extend our forefathers' Pan-African dream into a brave new world in order to bequeath the people of Africa and our future generations a much better, more secure and prosperous Africa that plays its role we are the continent of young people, hungry for better life and a clear role in the world affairs. Unfortunately, however, the discussive profile of the continent has too often been focused on the challenges and the difficulties we face and the assistance we need in a way that depicts us as chronically subordinate, eternally vulnerable, and perpetually incapable. As a consequence, 
An emerging psychology of victimhood implicates both African and global leadership in a politics of pity and helplessness. It also denies the world's youngest continent repository of unparalleled abundance, the agency to articulate appropriate solutions for its own problems and to offer its unique, indispensable contribution on the broader global stage. I am persuaded that our generation of African leaders has the historic mandate to retire this unhelpful profile and in its place articulate a more accurate and compelling portrait of Africa that is both faithful to fact yet also developmentally inspirational. <clears throat> Through this fundamental shift, we have the opportunity to empower and mobilize our people to drive transformation, attract investment, and inspire partnerships and collaborations across the world. I see a tremendously decisive role for yourselves as members of the Pan-African Parliament since you represent the voices of Africans on all issues pertaining to every sphere and sector of individual and collective endeavor. Please don't let us down. The need to urgently undertake fundamental shift in understanding Africa's global role is overwhelming evidence on the subject of climate change. At the moment, conversations about climate change in Africa focus on the fact that Africa's contribution to global greenhouse gas emissions is minimal at between 3 and 4 percent, yet the impact of con consequent climate change on our people is huge. This discourse also mainly focuses on the questions of compensation for loss and damage and funding for adaptation, mitigation, and resilience. This focus on matters that are clearly urgent tend to dominate and obscure the equally imperative matter of radical economic transformation. I consider rapid economic growth to be indispensable to the achievement of stable and dignified livelihoods for all, as well as the creation of lasting resilience. At the same time, I worry about the mainstream perspective where prosperity is often regarded, ironically, as incompatible with environmental sustainability and relegated to the margins of global agenda for Africa. I will explain this a bit later. As a matter of fact, many Africa's global partners evasively scat around this necessary conversation, making it difficult and uncomfortable. Explicitly and implicitly, they encourage Africa to focus on managing the consequences of climate change. Since only others in the global north are understood to possess the capacity to, sol to solve the global problems of such character and magnitude. This unjust dynamic is unnecessary, inappropriate, and only serves to hold us back from fulfilling our potential. Good people, let me ask you, who said that Africa cannot be part of the solution? That when Africa is being discussed, it's only being discussed in the context of the problems. And our voices, our voices are limited to 
or no, you are victims of climate change, we will help you to manage the uh, situation. We will manage you to deal with adaptation. We will look for some little money for mitigation. We do not want to be in that corner. We want to be in the conversation about the solutions. And we have what it takes. And shortly, I will be proposing to you why I consider that, in fact, the reason why we have been in a circus for all these years, it's because we as Africans have not stepped forward with our capabilities to provide the solution to this challenge of climate change. As the chair of the Committee of African Heads of State and Governments on Climate Change, I fully associate myself with the consensus that has evolved among Africa's leaders who have refused to be tethered to this unsatisfactory ideology. Instead, we have been pushing a fresh, affirmative, and solution-oriented perspective. And I have come here today to ask you to join us in executing this change of course, articulating a fundamentally pan-African principle and amplifying new ethos that summons the world to live, produce, and consume in harmony with nature that will be spearheaded by Africa. The single most important priority commitment that will propel Africa to lasting security, sustainable stability, and shared prosperity is an opportunity-oriented focus on climate change. Our continent's abundant health, wealth of natural resources, immense endowments of untapped green renewable energy, our youthful democratic, uh, demographic profile, and our increasingly enlarging market precisely constitute the fundamental elements required to mitigate and then reverse climate change while driving a new green industrial revolution. Africa's untapped renewable energy, let me give you some numbers. Africa's untapped renewable energy potential is more than 50 times the world's cumulative demand by 2030. The continent's untapped solar, wind, and geothermal potential is rated as super abundant in most African countries, meaning the potential is over 1,000 times the current demand. Yet, nearly 600 million Africans lack access to electricity, while another 150 million have highly unreliable access and a whopping 900 million Africans have no access to clean cooking energy. Just imagine the paradox that we are in the middle of plenty while living in scarcity. The primary cause of Africa's minimal investment in, in its in exploiting its abundant green energy potential is the lack of energy intense anchor demand. Such demand would make investment in additional energy generation capacity bankable and render universal energy access possible. Scientists tell us that achieving the net zero emissions by 2050 is imperative to sustain human civilization. Failure to reach this target will lead to devastating and irreversible impacts on ecosystems, weather patterns, and sea levels. At present rates, it will be extremely difficult, if not altogether impossible, 
for the world's industrial nations and fast-growing emerging economies to achieve net zero goals on time. The only way for the world to achieve this net zero aspiration by 2050 is for countries which presently have net negative emissions as we do in most of Africa. And I, and I really want you to listen to me on this point because this is the turning point. The only way for the world to achieve the net zero aspiration by 2050 is for countries which presently have net negative emissions as we do in most of Africa to make up for those on course to missing the 2050 goal. The implication of this scenario is that African countries are uniquely positioned to limit own emissions <coughs> and at the same time contribute reductions everywhere. We are not only in a position that we can limit our own emissions, but we can assist others. We can contribute to the reduction by others. The opportunity therefore exists to provide energy access for all Africans by 2030, while reducing total emissions from energy generation by creating green industrial capacity in Africa thus positioning the continent to support the global net zero ambition. The clearest path is to relocate global industrial production capacity to Africa and therefore meet Africa's as well as world's growing demand for goods and services. Let me take that again so that we are clear. The clearest path available to humanity, not just to us, available to humanity, is to relocate global industrial production capacity to Africa and therefore meet Africa's as well as the world's growing demand for goods and services in a green fast manner that also enables the continent to leapfrog the industrial development path taken by the Global North. An African green industrial capacity will not only serve global demand, but it will also decarbonize global production, thereby fulfilling humanity's most ambitious climate goals. This is the very honest conversation we want to have. We are saying we can have a win-win in this engagement. We do not have to engage in the usual finger-pointing. You caused this, you did not cause that. That's all fine. We contributed the least, that's fine. We are suffering the most, that's okay. But we can together agree on a solution that carries everybody. And that is the proposition we are having as the leadership of this continent. We are not selfish. We are willing to share, to present our resources so that we can not only solve our problem, but we can solve the global problem of climate change. Let me tell you more. For the first time in history, low or no emission production processes for products like steel, fertilizer, and hydrogen are technically feasible and economically efficient thanks to Africa's abundant renewable energy potential. Moreover, Primary processes of essential ores present a major opportunity for Africa to effectively balance its energy and climate ambition. Africa has 30 to 40 percent of the world's minerals, including those on which the green energy transition depends. 
the availability of these significant deposits makes a compelling case for Africa to be a global hub for manufacturing. For example, the simple decision to process the 80 million tons of iron ore annually exported by Africa to Europe and China and to process steel from plants close to mines in Africa averts the emission of nearly 7 million tons of carbon dioxide equivalent in just one year. Processing over 110 million tons of bauxite exported annually from Africa to Europe and Asia at aluminum factories near the mines using renewable energy can also avoid between 1.3 and 1.5 gigatons of carbon dioxide every year, which is 3% of all global house gas emissions. What am I saying? I am saying instead of exporting the iron ores and the bauxite to be processed in Europe and China. If the decision was reversed so that we still get the same steel, but this time round, it is processed in Africa. You don't have to transport the ores. Use the renewable energy in Africa instead of the fossil fuel and, and uh, uh, um, uh, carbon energy in, in Europe. It is a simple decision. We will still get the steel for everybody. But let's change the paradigm. Instead of transporting iron ore and engaging in huge footprints of carbon, let us process the iron ores and the bauxite in Africa. And we are willing. <laughs> Once it is processed in Africa, we will sell the steel to our friends. We will do two things. We will have created jobs in our continent. We will have done green for everybody, green industrialization for everybody. We will have reduced emissions for everybody. And we will have contributed to solving this big equation of carbon emissions. It is as simple as that. It is just as simple as that. You don't need any rocket science to, it is just as, as simple as, as, as it gets. Let me give you an example from Kenya. Kenya is a perfect case in point. Our comparatively small national grid is about three gigawatts but consists of 92% renewable energy. We aspire to make our grid 100% renewable by 2030, in the next eight years, while executing a quantum leap in grid size to 100 gigawatts and 100% renewable by 2040. The small grid size and relatively high energy cost, production cost, that is, is in the past made it hard to attract energy intense industry to Kenya. By recognizing the need to develop industrial anchor demand and shaping our plans accordingly, we have prioritized green industrialization and now aim to make carbon credits one of Kenya's biggest export products. In a month, we will have uh, con completed the institutional and legal framework for us to access, manage, and participate in the carbon market space. For the record, all the carbon trading in the African continent, let me say, 25% at the moment is happening in Kenya. I want to encourage I want to encourage us as a continent that that is the future. And the legislators here from different parliaments in our continent must carry this back home. 
to support this, we are working on the appropriate institutional framework to anchor carbon market regulation, align fiscal incentives, and a green investor-friendly environment that ensures communities benefit as businesses also flourish. We are therefore organizing and building our internal government capacity accordingly. And I dare say every other government, every other parliament must begin to internalize and to work along this line. The same will be true for our food production. As the world embraces regenerative agriculture, we recognize that our agricultural practices largely comply with a new approach. We must therefore commit to apply productive technologies driven by renewable energy, such as solar powered irrigation, along with resilient seed varieties, to increase our yields and farming in climate smart ways to generate soil health and additional carbon revenues. It is essential to point out the additional benefits of relocating industrial production to Africa in terms of strengthening our balance of trade, ease pressure on our currencies, and mitigating the vulnerability arising out of dependency on capricious supply chains, as is the case in our fertilizer supply. Case in point is what happened in Ukraine and Russia. We have all it takes to grow our industries and make Africa the clean, green factory of the world. My call today is for us to do so in a way that is green from the start, so as to capitalize on the exclusive competitive advantage we have. No other continent has the advantage that we have as a continent. Another major opportunity for the continent is in carbon removal using hybrid solutions, including nature-based and technological solutions. Our continent has the potential to remove over 300 million tons of CO2 per year through nature-based solutions such as landscape restoration, reforestation, and mangrove forest protection and expansion. These measures, at a carbon price of US dollars 50 per ton, could provide in excess of 15 billion US dollars in revenue, create more than 85 million jobs, and improve millions of livelihoods. Of course, I am well aware that the prices we currently get on average are US dollars 5 per ton. It is unacceptably unfair given that everywhere else prices go up to between 100 and 200 US dollars per ton. That's the conversation we need to have. We need a carbon market that has integrity. And this way, we wouldn't be asking for money for debt. We wouldn't be asking for debt relief. We wouldn't be begging for um, grants and aid. We will be making a positive contribution to humanity and earning out of the assets of our continent. <laughs> Regarding engineered solutions, Kenya startups are exploring the use of the Rift Valley geo geological formations for mineralized storage <coughs> to replicate the success reported elsewhere in geologically comparable landscape, such as in the Iceland. If you can generate carbon credits in Iceland, we can also generate carbon credits from the fissures in the Rift Valley. Market and market access are issues of cardinal significance as we articulate growth strategies centered on green development opportunities in our continent, we must also establish enabling policies and regulations that foster incentives to make Africa an attractive destination for the growing pool of global capital-seeking climate-positive opportunities. 
the Africa Continental Free Trade Area Agreement is a major step in the right direction to the extent that it, it seeks to enhance trade within the continent and presents the continent as one large trading area.